Kardashian for inviting me. Um, I also want to uh, thank Alicia Kumar for assistance in preparing this workshop. Want to make sure I'm, uh, that her voice is also kind of represented here. So without further ado, um, who are the women on campus taking an intersectional lens? So the learning objectives that I have for us today are to identify social identities uh, associated with power and privilege, define the concept of intersectional identities, recognize the social influences of bias, apply the concepts of intersectionality to allyship behaviors, and then uh, breakout rooms for how can we be allies here at UTC. So here's our, our roadmap. I'm talking about introduction, general information about social identities, intersectionality, allyship, and allyship in practice. So first and foremost, social identities and intersectionality. Um, your social identity is your sense of self. And oftentimes that sense of self is going to be based on your affiliations with different groups. Um, when we're talking about for the presentation today is more demographic type of variables, but your social identity could be, I'm a member of you know, this sports like fandom. Like I support the New York Giants. I know they haven't been doing well, but I still support them. Um, so your social identity, your sense of self, and typically it's based on your affiliations with the different groups. Now, with social identity, um, and this pulls from the United States, they say that we have a few social characteristics, goes with what we call the addressing model, um, and that we have age, developmental disability, disability status acquired, religion, ethnicity, social class, sexual orientation, indigenous background, national origin, and gender. So it's the idea that, oh, wait a minute, I am not just a woman, but I have all of these other additional social identities. And when we talk about these social identities and specifically within the United States, we have to talk about who has power and who has less power. Um, so for instance, we'll start with the first one with age. Uh, may we all first and foremost be lucky enough to live a long life. And with that, you see power, who has power, adults have power, but people who are children or adolescents or elders typically have less power. So this is one of the only social characteristics where everybody is fluctuating, should we live long enough, um, and I hope we do, to fluctuate between power and less power. I mean, think about when you were a kid. Well, can't I stay up late? No. Um, can't my curfew be later? No. Can't I have a brownie for breakfast? No. I mean, how many of y'all have had a brownie for breakfast as an adult? Brian's shaking his head. I've had cake for breakfast and it tasted real good, right? But I had that power to make that decision. As a child, you typically don't have that. But then we see as people get older and they become elders in our community, power is oftentimes then taken away. Oh, you're too old to know what you want. Or let me just get that for you. You know, I don't think that you can do that by yourself. So age is one of the social characteristics that we all fluctuate through. Um, no, another social characteristic, developmental disability. Who's in power? Who gets to make the rules and the laws? People who are neurotypical. People who have less power are those who are not neurotypical. Um, for instance, those who have autism. And yet when we go, okay, are you able to represent yourself? Who gets to make the rules on who's able to represent themselves um, if they are someone with autism or someone with Down syndrome? Disability status acquired, who has power? People without a disability. Um, so for instance, I was a tour guide in um, at my undergraduate institution and the, you know, the push buttons that you can use to open the doors. So that way it's, it makes it easier, it's wheelchair accessible. And we had just gotten those installed and we were so excited. And one of my um, friends was leading a tour with a uh, prospective student who was in a wheelchair and she leads them up and she goes, we just got these. It's going to make getting into buildings so much easier. And the student in the wheelchair goes, but I can't reach it. Because did we even test it with people who are in wheelchairs of where that button needs to go? Or is it just making that assumption? Um, if you've ever been on crutches, the world becomes significantly less accessible to you because we don't think about it, right? When we're designing things, we don't think about life with crutches. Um, we have what used to be called cardiac hill on campus. And now it's a whole bunch of steps. That's not very accessible to a whole lot of people um, who have disability statuses. For religion, um, it, within the United States, people who have power are Christians. People who have power are those who are not Christian. Um, so for instance, what is our school year based around? 
the Christian holidays. Um, I don't identify as Christian. I am Jewish, and I grew up in the South with a very small Jewish community in my um, in my city. And I remember saying, you know, I have to miss school. It's going to be a test, um, but it's my high holiday. Like I have to go to temple. This is this is my most important holiday of the year. And a teacher goes, um, you're just missing school because you want to. The holidays are Christmas and Easter. And I went, okay. And so it was a fight to be able to get me to do, and I was asking to do it early, like not even late, like give me the test early. Um, and it was a really big barrier and a fight to go through. Um, ethnicity, people who are in power, European Americans. I'm a white woman. I get to make as a white person, what is considered to be beautiful, right? White people, white standards, what's beautiful. Social class, those who are middle-class and educated people. Um, sexual orientation, heterosexual people have more power, less power, people who aren't. And we see this consistently, even within Hollywood, within the media, the movies that we see, the um, TV shows that are on, the books that are coming out, all very much based upon heterosexual relationships and not a whole lot on people who aren't heterosexual. We also have indigenous background. Uh, Non-native people have power. In fact, we have so much power that we've put native people in reservations and said, here you go, here's your little piece of land, thank us, you know, thank us later for it. National origin, those who are US born have more power. Um, and gender, men typically have more power than women. But when we talk about this, I'm not just a woman. What extra power and privilege do I have because I'm a white woman? But what, what areas do I have less power because I'm a white woman who's also Jewish? And what does that look like? So when we have these characteristics with groups in power, and I've touched on some of these already, um, what kind of power does the dominant group have? So for instance, I'll bring up again, being Jewish, less power. Um, the dominant group has limited awareness of or knowledge about subordinate groups. Growing up in a small community in the South, I had people telling me, well, you're Jewish, so you must be rich. I haven't seen that money falling from trees anywhere, but that was the perception. Um, the teacher who told me that, hey, this is not actually a holiday for you. I don't know why you're asking to take something early. Um, our school newspaper, which the principal had to read through and, you know, and, and approve before it was published. Um, and in it, they had, oh, welcome to the holidays. And there was a two or three page spread on Christmas and what it was all about. And Hanukkah had a small section. And in it, it said, Jews get presents on um, Hanukkah because they were jealous that Christians got presents for Christmas. And that jealous was the word in there. I took multiple copies of this newspaper because I went, wow. And I say, where did you get this information to the person who wrote it? And she goes, well, the internet. And I said, okay. But as a subordinate group, I know all about Christian holidays and the differences and the different sects of Christianity um, and who's going to be more likely to celebrate what and go to church when and the different times that church is happening. The dominant group um, also gets to create truth or reality. Um, who writes the history? The victors. That's the dominant group. So for instance, uh, in the United States, we still celebrate Columbus Day. And what did Columbus do? Well, he brought a whole bunch of people to desecrate the people who were already here. But yet the truth and reality that we celebrate Columbus Day, Thanksgiving, well, the indigenous people were so kind and so helpful. So we're celebrating that we all shared everything together. And the indigenous people were so kind and so helpful. Um, it was the Europeans who were not so kind and not so helpful but yet it's seen as, yes, let's celebrate this. Um, dominant group typically is a sense um, of belonging, walking into a room and going, I belong here, versus a subordinate group, not necessarily feeling, you know, really invisible if they don't see me or hyper visible of, wow, I must represent all of these particular groups. So when we talk about power and privilege, we typically then don't even think about wow, what does the dominant group have that a subordinate group you know, might not have? Um, from psychology research, establishing, for instance, norms and standards, 
we've established beauty norms and standards in the United States, essentially for the rest of the world. Uh, there were islands in the Pacific where the beauty standard for women was to be um, was to be fat. And it was, if you were fat, that meant you have resources, you have food to eat, you're able to take care of your children, um, you're healthy enough to procreate. And then they got American television. And within five years, the new standard was to be thin and model thin. And so we've established that norm and standard of here's what it is. Um, beauty standards are, for instance, straight hair. Um, so black women feeling like, hey, I have to make sure that my hair is pressed and straight because wearing it natural goes against what's considered professional in our society. Um, there were rules in workplaces, and there still are, about hairstyles and saying natural hair is unacceptable. What do you mean natural hair is unacceptable? Um, while I don't have the experience um, that Black women do, I have been told before that curly hair is considered unprofessional and that I need to consider straightening it, but that is not okay, that people won't take me seriously. And that's just coming from a white woman perspective. Um, not people who have, you know, natural hair or what we would call ethnic hair when it's hair. So let's talk about it. What's the privilege actually mean? This is the social, economic, or political advantages that people are enjoying simply because they're a part of a certain group. I enjoy, because I'm a white person, the privilege that if I am pulled over, I don't have to fear for my life. That is a privilege that I have. Um, if you wanna talk about sports teams, when Tom Brady played for the New England Patriots and they were the team to be and all that sort of stuff. I know Brian, you're shaking your head. I can't stand the Patriots either, nor Tom Brady. However, they were the team that was the one to beat. Like they won so many Super Bowls. And so someone who was even just on the practice team had the privilege of saying, well, I play for the Patriots. Let me get you all this free stuff. Let me do all this stuff for you. Now, my husband, bless him, is a Cleveland Browns fan. And people say, well, I play for the Browns. And if you're not um, as football conscious, the Browns are one of the most terrible teams in the NFL, have been for decades. Um, it's, they're not that great. But people go, oh, well, you play for the Browns. So not wanting, right? They don't enjoy those same privileges, that social benefits, economic benefits, because they weren't part of the Patriots. Um, so this is examples of privilege. Just because you're part of a certain group, you have these privileges. Because you are Christian, you have the privilege that everything is shut down for your main holidays. Um, for people who are Jewish, my parents had to take sick days for the high holidays. It was sick days or vacation days, take your pick. Um, it wasn't something that was granted of like, yes, this doesn't count you know, against any of the days that you need to be taking off. Um, again, going back to like not being in a wheelchair, I'm able to open the door and not really have to think about it versus when we first started getting those push buttons to open doors automatically, they put them so close to the door that they still weren't helpful because you'd push it and the door would immediately open into you, not even giving you time to back up and move away. So these are privileges that we may have just because we're part of a certain group and may not be experiencing or even knowledgeable about what other groups are going through. So bringing back up intersectionality, the idea that every individual embodies multiple social identities and these social identities vary in terms of power and status. So for instance, a white woman who is lesbian has a very different experience from a Latina woman who is lesbian, has a different experience from a black woman who is lesbian. Even though they share the same characteristics of woman and lesbian, there's different types of social identities with power and status. So when we think about women, we can't say, well, all women have these experiences because we don't. We're all having very, very different experiences. Um, I was just actually in a panel right before this talking with a group of black high school girls and my panelists were black women. And the question that was posed to us was, can you talk about your experiences as a woman? And I went, 
whoo, yeah, we're just going to shut the mouth and we're going to wait because my experience in the workplace as a white woman is very different than the experiences of my black woman colleagues. Um, and what they've experienced both at, and not necessarily in academia, uh, but also outside of academia, what they've experienced in undergraduate, um, in graduate school. So making sure that we are looking at the combinations of these social identities is really important to understanding how can we help um, move equity for women forward. So pulling back up the addressing model and kind of thinking through where do you have power, where do you not have power, and how does that intersect um, to give more light or shed more light on your experiences. There are also discussions within psychology about some things that you can potentially hide. Like I can hide that I'm Jewish. Yes, I chose to say it, but I can hide and not wear like a Jewish star around my neck. Um, I can decide that, you know what, I'm gonna wait and not say anything about that. Um, some people can choose to hide their sexual orientation, like hide it and blend and be like, nope, I don't want anyone to know that. Um, I know for me that I hide sometimes that I'm educated because then all of a sudden people are going to go, oh, well, you know, we have to defer to her. And I don't want to be put in that position of power. I'd rather it be, let's have a conversation um, of all of us working together. So adding another layer, specifically at UTC, how does power then influence what happens at UTC? For faculty, um, tenured faculty typically have the most power. Tenure track, not as much. Lecturer, definitely not as much. And not really anything for adjunct. Um, where are you in administration, staff, students? But again, with all of those intersecting identities, right? It's not just someone is a white student, but are we meeting the needs of our black students? Are we meeting the needs of our brown students? Are we meeting the needs of our international students? So adding that additional layer of what power might look like here at UTC. So then we have to ask, how did we get here? Um, and there's a whole lot of trainings that go, well, let's look at the, let's look at the camera. I'm gonna tell you, everybody has biases. And that doesn't really help us move forward because we have these social influences, how we got here is quite literally through social influences. We need to be quick in making decisions. Um, we have these heuristics that I have to make snap judgments. If we didn't make you know, snap judgments, we probably would never be able to leave where we're living in, at all during the day. And we probably still wouldn't have figured out what kind of coffee we're having in the morning or what we're having for breakfast because there's a million different options that you would need to consider versus, oh, look, the cornflakes are first in my drawer. We're having cornflakes, easiest decision, right? We make these snap judgments because it's how our brain is able to process a lot of moving pieces and information throughout the day. Unfortunately, how we process things is from our socialized biases. Um, so for instance, screen capture, um, unfortunately, one of the many instances of these, uh, one of the many instances of these tweets, my first meeting of the day went like this. What's your title? Who do you report to? What's your title again? What's your background? How long have you been at this organization? Just because she was a black woman walking in to more of like a managerial executive leadership space. Because it was the assumption, wait a minute, a black woman in a leadership space, hold up, who are you? I need to double check on this. So these social influences that we've been basically socialized to have is based on power and privilege and how our society has been set up. Now, the good thing, and this is one of my very favorite quotes, is what you think first is oftentimes what you've been socialized to think. What you think second is what you really think. So when you have these automatic biases that are coming to mind, it's not that you're a bad person, it's that that's how society has socialized us into thinking. What we think second, that's what we really think. That's what we're like, oh, right, this is, you know, I'm actually spending time not doing heuristics, not having those automatic assumptions but spending time thinking about things. And so this is how we can change those automatic assumptions. It's not easy. I'm still working on changing a whole lot uh, because I did grow up um, as a white woman in the South. So I'm still working on changing some of that first snap judgments that I make, 
but I don't judge myself for them. I go, right, okay, this is what I'm really thinking. And then how do I move forward from there? And how do I turn what I'm really thinking then into that particular, what we would say, snap judgment? So then we think, okay, how exactly do we help fix it, right? The cognitive processes and what can we do? Um, so oftentimes we talk about allyship. And so allyship is technically defined um, as using your dominant group social status to support members of marginalized groups to work toward ending systemic oppression and prejudice. So this is not saying, oh, every person, this is it. But how do we end the systemic oppression? How do we end the, um, for instance, the school to prison pipeline for our black students, for our brown students? That's systemic oppression that we have. Um, how do we use that dominant group status? Well, one, we wanna work with oppressed groups. So as a white person, I can't speak for black people or for brown people. So if I'm going to an event that's promoting black women, I need to work with them. I need to listen. I need to learn and then support and grow voices rather than talking over. Um, we can increase awareness of additional barriers faced by people with different social identities. Again, the things that we don't necessarily think about, like using a wheelchair to get into the different doors and being able to push those buttons. What are barriers that we don't even know of? I'm still learning every single day. Um, I make mistakes every single day. But the idea of being allyship or the idea of allyship is being deliberate and continuous, knowing you're going to make mistakes, giving yourself grace for them and going, okay, I messed up, but how do I move forward? So how do I continue to listen? How do I continue to learn and be deliberate so that way I can best represent all voices? So authentic allyship um, can look like educating yourself. So if you're going, oh, I want to learn more about this area, Google, as we, Google can be good, Google can be bad, but know that there are especially a lot of lists already out there hey, you want to learn more about Black history? Consider following these people on Twitter, considering reading these particular books. So rather than depending upon someone from a marginalized group to have to explain everything to you, see what learning that you can do. Um, don't do it to brand yourself. So for instance, I don't get to call myself an ally. Every other person gets to make a decision of if I am an ally or if I'm not an ally. And it is okay if people don't see me as an ally, that's not my decision to get to make. Um, so we could have people, for instance, from the LGBTQ plus community and one person's like, you know what? I don't see her as an ally. She's not doing the work that needs to be done. And someone else could go, no, but I think she is. And that's okay. Be but we, uh, whatever group you're in that has power, don't necessarily get to, self, get to call yourself an ally for others who are marginalized. Uh, we need to examine our own privilege and use it to help. Know that it's not about us. Yes, it's like, well, I'm doing all this work and people aren't seeing it. But again, it's not about us. It's about, are we actually helping the communities that we want to? And sitting with that discomfort, especially when we learn things that are like, wow, I can't believe that this has been happening. Um, expressing empathy, grief, outrage, but also taking risks and holding yourself and others accountable. 